Namaste. In this lecture, we'll have a look at population genetics. Now, what is a population? A population is a localized group of individuals that are capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offsprings. So, for instance, if we consider the subcontinent of India, now we have a tiger population that is found here in the Sundarbans. And we have a tiger population that is found here in Rajasthan, say the tigers that are there in Sariska. And then we also have a, a population of tigers that is found here in, in the south, say the tigers of Mudumalai. Now, what happens is that all of these different populations of tigers, they are comprised of individuals of the same species, Panthera tigris. But what we observe here is that the tigers of Sundarbans will be breeding amongst themselves, the tigers of Sariska will be breeding amongst themselves and the tigers of Mudubali will be breeding amongst themselves. There is a very little chance that tigers from Sundarbans go to Mudubali or tigers from Sundarbans go to Sariska. So, in this case, we say that these different populations of tigers, these different localized groups of individuals of the tiger species that are capable of interbreeding and, and producing fertile offsprings. So, these different localized groups are interbreeding and they are producing fertile offsprings and they can even interbreed amongst each other, but they are not doing so probably because of geographical distances or probably because of, of some hindrance that is there. So, it is not just the, the distances, but also say in this area we have some mountains. So, it becomes difficult for these tigers to go out into the other population. So, we call these as population. So, population is a localized group of individuals of the same species. So, remember here we are not considering individuals of different species, but individuals of the same species that are capable of interbreeding and producing uh, fertile offsprings. Now, population genetics is the study of how populations change genetically over time. So, what do we mean by this? So, let us let us put one more population here, let us put the Madhya Pradesh population here. Now, what happens is that even though all of these individuals are of the same species Panthera tigris, but over time we see some differences between these tigers. So, for instance, the tigers in Sundarbans, they have adapted to a life uh, in water or that is surrounded by water. So, the, uh, the areas of Sundarbans are extremely marshy areas and these tigers may have to swim a lot. So, we have observed over time that their bone density has reduced, they have become much leaner and they have also become much less lightweight, so that they are easily able to swim longer distances. But if you consider the tigers of Madhya Pradesh, where, where they are not exposed to, to situations where they have to swim a lot, so they have grown very big in size. And then tigers of Sariska, so there uh, it is a very uh, hot and dry area. So, they will be having been very different uh, adaptations as compared to tigers in Madhumalai. They will even be having very different food preferences. So, population genetics asks this question, when uh, considering all of these different populations, how are these populations changing over time? And not just over time, how are these changing at the genetic level? So, essentially, if we take the genome of the tigers that are found in Sundarbans and if we take the genome of the tigers that are found in Mudumalai, are we expected to find any changes? Are there any differences between both of these? And if so, what has brought about these changes or these differences over time? So, all of these questions are asked in the field of population genetics. Now, a good example can be this. This is the example of peppered moth. Now, before moving on, let us see if you can uh, make out the peppered moths in both of these images. So, in this image, we can very clearly see that this is a peppered moth and in this image, this is a peppered moth. But then, if you look closely, you will find that this is also a peppered moth. This is a triangular shape that is coming out here and this is the, the body of the animal. And in this one, we have a peppered moth that is here in this triangle. This is the body of the animal and this is the peppered moth. Now, 
why is it that we are seeing only one individual in both of these images and why is this story important as an example case for population genetics. Now, peppered moth is a moth. So, a moth is an insect that looks very much like a butterfly, but it has a very stout abdomen and quite a lot of hairs on its body. So, this is an insect that was extensively studied in the Great Britain. Now, what happened was in the earlier times, these are uh, the surfaces of the trees and on these and these surfaces looked pretty much grayish or whitish in color. Now, in this uh, species, we have two different colors. One is a dark color and one is a light color. So, this dark color is known as the melanistic version because it has more darker colors. So, now, in the earlier periods before the industrial revolution, most of the trees look like this. And in such a scenario, any of these light colored peppered moths were quite camouflaged in, the, in their surroundings, but any of these dark colored peppered moths were seen very easily. Now, what happened was there are a number of uh, predators like a number of birds that feed on these peppered moths. Now, in this scenario, they were able to very clearly see this black one, but they were not able to see the white one. So, what happened was all these black ones were preferentially predated upon. And so, if we looked at the population of peppered moths in the Great Britain, we would find that a number of individuals were in the light color and there were hardly any individuals that had a darker color. Now, when the industrial revolution came in and there were a number of industries that were spewing out smoke and this smoke settled on the surfaces of the trees as well and it killed off all of these lighter colored lichens that were found on the trees. So, now in this image we have these lichens and in this image we can clearly see the bark of the tree. Now, when this lighter color was gone and this soot deposition made uh, these surfaces dark in color, now what happened was these lighter colored individuals that were, uh, were earlier camouflaged, now they appear very distinctly out there on the surface of the tree. Whereas, the darker colored individuals that were earlier showing off, now they become camouflaged. So, if we look at the distribution of peppered moths, so let us say the, num the numbers and let us say our time. So, in the period before industrial revolution, so let us divide it into three stages. So, this is before industrial revolution, this is uh, say during and after industrial revolution and this is after environmental acts were passed. Now, in the period before the industrial revolution, we observed that we had uh, lighter colored uh, tree surfaces and on these lighter colored surfaces, we had a number of individuals that were light in color and we had very few number of individuals that were dark in color. So, this is how the, the population appeared before the industrial uh, revolution because all these trees were light in color and the lighter ones were more camouflaged. Now, during and after the industrial revolution, we got a situation in which the lighter colored individuals population or the number went down and the darker ones increased because with all of these uh, dark colored tree surfaces the lighter ones were preferentially predated upon and the darker ones were left out. So, we saw that after a while a number of individuals were darker in color and there were very few number of individuals that were lighter. Now, what happened was after the great smog of uh, London, so there was a very heavy outcry because of these industries and because of the smoke that was given out not only by these industries, but also in the homes. So, a number of environmental acts were passed, the Clean Air Act and so on. So, after that, these barks again became uh, devoid of the suit and they again moved back into the lighter color. So, once that happened, again we had the same situation as before, the black moths were, uh, were very clearly visible and the white ones were not visible. And so, after a while, we saw that the lighter population again became more dominant and the darker population were preferentially eaten out. So, this is at the level of the phenotype. But then, as we saw in the previous class, in the case of the color of the flower, we had considered two alleys, one was a purple and one was the white colored. 
Similarly, in this case we had two alleles, one was say a dark colored, so let us call it dark and the second one was a light in color. Now, we do not know which one is the dominant one, so we will call it D1 and D2 or say D dark and D light. Now, these are two alleles that are found in the population. If you have an individual that has the dark allele, then it becomes darker in color. If you have individuals that are homozygous for the light alleles, we have the lighter individuals. But when we observe these phenotypes, then we can also see that there was a change in the genotypes of or the uh, or the frequencies of these alleles that were found there in the population. So, because of the impact of the environment as trees became darker, so the frequency of the darker alleles increased and then later on it decreased. Now, questions such as these or studies such as these are done in the field of population genetics. Now, these are some differences, but then how are these differences different from or similar to the evolution that we talk about. So, uh, population genetics is very closely related to evolution. Evolution is the genetic adaptation of organisms to their environment. Now, in the case of our peppered moths, we are also seeing a genetic adaptation of the organisms to their environment. But then this genetic adaptation is only at the level of the different alleles and the frequencies of these alleles that are found in the population. But then once these, uh, these genetic adaptations become so permanent uh, that they may even lead to a new species, then we can relate that to the evolution of the newer species. So, when we talk about evolution, so here also the, the population is evolving to a threat or this population is evolving to a new uh, change in the environment that has come up. Now, evolution when we look at its definition, it says genetic adaptation to the environment. So, what is adaptation? So, adaptation refers to any alteration in the structure or function of an organism by which the organism becomes better able to survive and multiply in its environment. So, in the case of our peppered moth, there was an alteration in the structure of the organism or in the color of the organism because of which the organism became better able to survive and multiply in its environment. So, it was an adaptation. Was it genetic? A genetic means related to genes or informational sequences regarding traits or functions or heredity. So, was this adaptation a genetic adaptation? The answer is yes, because it was because of a change in the frequencies of these different alleles of this particular gene that was coding for the body color, which was found in the population. So, it was a genetic adaptation, it was an inheritable fitness. Why was this an inheritable fitness? Because in the case of uh, coming back to the drawing board. So, in the case of these individuals that were darkened in color, their progeny were also darkened in color because they were having these alleles in preference. So, it became a fitness that was inheritable. So, it moved through heredity. So, why do we call it a fitness and what is the definition of a fitness? Fitness is the ability of a particular organism to leave descendants in future generations relative to other organisms. So, basically when we talked about these darker colored peppered moths in this period during and after the industrial revolution where the barks of the trees were getting darker. So, this darker color was able to give it an ability of leaving more number of descendants in the future generations because not only was the adult moth saved from the predators, but also its progeny were also saved from the predators because they were also darker in color relative to the other organisms and these other organisms were those in the lighter color. So, in this period these darker individuals had an advantage before the industrial revolution and after the these uh, environmental acts were passed the lighter colored individuals had a more advantage. So, if this fitness evolution acts to maximize fitness through the process of natural selection, if this fitness continued for a longer period of time, then it would have been selected through the process of natural selection in the process of evolution. So, what are the characteristics of fitness? Fitness is environment specific. So, in the environment where we had lighter colored tree barks, there was uh, the lighter color that was giving fitness. In the environment where we had darker colored tree barks, there was a darker color that was giving 
the fitness. So, it is environment specific. Also, it is species specific. So, this dark and light color would have helped the peppered moth, but maybe it would not have helped much the predators. So, this fitness is species specific. Then high reproductive rate alone does not mean higher fitness, but higher survival of more progeny does. So, it could also be possible that in the middle period, in this period when we were, so in this central period where we were having, uh, I mean during and after the industrial revolution where we were having darker colored tree barks, it is also possible that these individuals that were lighter in color were having more number of progenies. So, for every female moth say this one was giving say 10,000 eggs and this one was giving say 8,000 eggs. But just higher number of eggs or higher reproductive rate will not mean a higher fitness because it is also related to the higher survival of more progeny. So, in the case of these 10,000 individuals, suppose 9,000 of them were eaten away and only 1,000 were left. But in this case, suppose only 100 were eaten away and so 7,900 were left. So, in this case, we would say that this has a higher fitness. Next, fitness should be measured across several generations, it is a long term measure. Now, in this case, uh, a peppered moth has a very short generational time, so it is a few months. So, we are talking about a long period as compared to the generational time, we are talking about say a few decades of times at a go. So, fitness has to be measured across several generations, it cannot be, be measured in one generation or two generations. And fitness works at the level of the complete organism, not on individual traits such as size or speed. So, when we talk about fitness, we are talking about whether the organism was able to survive and produce a number of offsprings and those offsprings were able to, uh, uh, to survive uh, for the next generation. So, it is not related to just one or few traits of the organism, but it, de it deals with the complete survival of the individual. So, it works at the level of the complete organism, not at the individual traits. Now, when we say that fitness is selected by natural selection, then natural selection is defined as the process in nature by which only those organisms that are best adapted to their environment tend to survive and transmit their genetic characteristics to the succeeding generations, while those less adapted tend to be eliminated. So, in this case of peppered moths, we can say that the body color was giving the organisms a way of surviving and transmitting their genes to the next generation or to the succeeding generations and those individuals that were not having the right color of body as compared to the color of the trees in their environment, they were eliminated out. So, this is a process in which the nature is selecting some individuals that are better adapted to the given environmental conditions. So, if it is a dark colored environment, the dark individuals are better adapted. So, the nature selects for them. So, those get a, a, a greater chance to survive and reproduce and their children also get a better chance to survive and reproduce. So, that is natural selection and it occurs in 5 stages or 5 steps. One is variation. So, all individuals are not identical and they have different characteristics. So, coming back to the drawing board. So, even in this period before the industrial revolution, it was not that because the these light colored individuals are better adapted. So, we only will have these light colored individuals, but we also have some dark colored individuals, even though they are not best adapted. Now, why is this variation important in nature? Because the environment might change. So, in this case, if these peppered moths did not have this dark colored variation, even when even in those periods where dark color was a handicap, then the whole of this population would not have been able to survive in the periods of the industrial revolution when the environment changed. Now, similarly, in our case, all of us are having different heights. Now, in, in, in this present scenario, the height does not play much of a role. It does not, it does not uh, decide whether we have a, a greater chance of survival or not, but even then this variation is there. Now, to give another example, suppose we have an individual who does not have uh, hands, who develops wings by way of some mutation. Now, in our, our present environmental context, this individual will not be able to write, this individual will not be able to uh, type, this individual will not be able to drive a car. So, in that case, 
this particular variation of having wings in place of hands may be uh, selected against by the nature because this individual will have a lesser chance of survival and uh, reproducing or to give uh, more uh, or more offspring for the next generation as compared to the other uh, the, the normal individuals that are having two hands but then suppose all of this area was flooded and all those people who were having two hands they drowned off but this individual who had wings was able to fly away so now in the next generation and suppose we have a group of such individuals that are having wings in place of hands now those individuals because they have been able to survive this flood in in the next generation will be having in the population more number of individuals that will be having wings in place of hands so natural selection is acting at all times and it it is acting on the variations that are there in the uh, population now the second thing is overpopulation of organisms tend to produce excess number of offsprings so a female mosquito may lay 500 to 1000 eggs now if all of these 1000 eggs were able to survive to the next generation then we would be having huge scarcity of resources because the resources are limited so out of these 500 to 1000 eggs say only two individuals will be able to survive to the next generation and produce offsprings why is that because there is a struggle for existence at all times the resources are limited and so not all the offsprings will be accommodated in the nature or in the environment now in the case of our paper moths this struggle for existence was also related to the struggle of uh, diverting or uh, saving oneself from the predators now this struggle for existence leads to the survival of the fittest only those individuals that are best able to obtain and use resources will survive and reproduce so in this case the survival of the fittest was related to the color of the moth and then the survival of the fittest also leads to changes in the gene pool so inherited characters increase the frequency of the favored traits in the population so coming back to the drawing board what it means in this period when we have more number of light colored individuals this d light genotype is being favored and so more and more of the individuals in the population will be having this genotype because they are getting it from their parents and so the the frequency of the lighter colored individuals will go up so this is leading to a change in the gene pool of the population in which the frequency of different genes or or different alleles is changing so coming to the gene pool gene pool stands for the total aggregate of genes in a population at any one time so in any population consider all the genes all the variations that are present there consider them all together and you get the gene pool now in the in the gene pool we can talk about the allele frequency or the proportion of an allele in the population so for instance uh, coming back to the drawing board in this case it is possible that our d light was present in 80% of the gene pool and our d dark was present in only 20% of the gene pool so we'll look at it in more detail in this example so consider a population with 640 plants with red flowers which uh, so in the case of these red flowers we have capital r capital r we are talking about a case of incomplete dominance 320 plants with pink flowers that is capital r and small r and 40 plants with white flowers that is small r small r so when we talk about the this complete uh, gene pool the total number of capital r alleles in this population will be given by 614 into 2 because all of these 640 individuals have two of the capital r alleles so 640 into 2 plus 320 into 1 because these have one single capital r plus these 40 individuals do not have any capital r so 40 into 0 which comes to 1600 and the number of small r alleles will be given by 640 into 0 because these do not have any small r plus 320 into 1 plus 40 into 2 because these are having two small r alleles so this comes to be 400 so total number of alleles in this population comes to 1600 plus 400 which is 2000 and the allele frequency of capital r will be given by 1600 divided by 2000 into 100% which comes to 80% and the allele frequency of small r will come to 400 divided by 2000 into 100% which is 20% so this is how we calculate the allele frequency now in the case of population genetics when the environment is changing these allele frequencies may change with time 
and this is something that is important for us to consider. Now, there are in a normal situation where there is no change in the environment, we, we should uh, we should assume that or we would hypothesize that these allele frequencies will not change and this is something that is given by the hardy weinberg principle. Now, hardy weinberg principle says that allele and genotype frequencies in a population will remain constant from generation to generation in the absence of other evolutionary influences. So, basically what this is saying is that if evolution is not happening, if there is no change that is going on, there is no adaptation, no, no natural selection that is going on, we would assume that the allele and the and the genotypic frequencies in the population will remain constant from generation to generation. Or in other words, we can also say that if allele and genotypic frequencies in a population are changing from generation to generation, then there are some evolutionary influences that are happening. So, coming back to our example, uh, we had calculated that the allele frequency of capital R is uh, 80 percent and the allele frequency of small r is 20 percent. So, we can also write this as the frequency of capital R which we can we can represent by small p is 80 percent or 0 0.8 and the allele frequency of small r that is f of r which we can represent in shorthand by small q is 20 percent is 0 0.2. Now, in the absence of, of evolutionary influences p and q will remain constant at every generation. So, even in the next generation we will have p is 0 0.8, even in the generation after that we will be having p is 0 0.8 and q will remain the same as 0 0.2. But not only will these remain constant, but also the proportions of the individuals. So, the proportion of capital R capital R individuals will be given by p into p which is 0.8 into 0.8 is 0 0.64 the frequency of small r smaller individuals will be given by r in, uh, by q into q which is 0.2 into 0.2 which is 0 0.04 and the proportion of capital r small r individuals will be given by 1 minus the sum of both of these which is which comes to be 0 0.32 so essentially what we are saying here is that if you have p is 0 0.8 q is 0 0.2 so in this case capital r capital r individuals the proportion of those is 0 0.8 into 0 0.8 is 0 0.64 and the proportion of uh, small r small r is given by q into q is 0.2 into 0 0.2 is 0 0.04. Now, because this population consists of capital R capital R small r small r plus capital R small r and this whole should equal to 1. So, we can say that capital R small r plus 0 0.64 plus 0.04 is equal to 1 or the number of capital R small r or the proportion. So, so the proportion of uh, capital R small r will be given by 1 minus 0 0.68 or 0 0.32. Now, we can also represent this in the form of a Punnett square. Now, in the Punnett square we have uh, like as before we were, were representing these two alleles capital R and small r and we are representing their proportions by uh, or their uh, their frequencies by these letters p and q. So, capital R capital R will be given by p square small r small r will be given by q square. Now, capital R small r can come either from this p q or it can come from this p q p and q. So, in this case we will have p square q square and 2 p q is equal to 1. Now, this is also something that should be obvious because we have p plus q 0 0.8 plus 0 0.2 is equal to 1 and in this case we are saying that p square plus q square plus twice p q is equal to 1 which should be there because this is the expansion of p plus q whole square. Now, we can also write this as a generalized equation. So, in place of considering only two alleles. So, in, in our example we were considering uh, capital R and small r, but let us say that we have n number of alleles. So, a 1, a 2, a 3 up till a n with their allele frequencies that are given by p 1, p 2 up till p n. So, we had represented this by only p and q in the previous example, but let us call these as p 1, p 2 up till p n because all of these alleles will be having some frequencies. So, we can say that the sum of all of these frequencies will be equal to 1 because that is how we are defining all of these uh, frequencies. So, in this case we are having that p 1 is the number of alleles of a 1 divided by 
the total number of alleles so sum of all of these similarly we have p2 is given by number of alleles of a2 divided by sum of all the alleles of ai so when we write sum of pi we have p1 plus p2 plus so on plus pn which is given by number of a1 divided by this value so let us represent this as x so number of a1 by x plus number of a2 by x plus so on plus number of an divided by x which will be equal to number of a1 plus number of a2 plus so on plus number of an whole divided by x now x in this case is the this sum so this x can be written as number of a1 plus number of a2 plus so on plus number of an so this is equal to 1 by 1 is equal to 1 so we have sum of pi's or p1 plus p2 plus p3 up till pn is equal to 1 and the frequencies of the homozygotes and the heterozygotes is given by the expansion of this whole term square so when we expand this and when we divide this uh, from the complete sum then we'll be getting the frequencies of different homozygotes and the heterozygotes now this happens in the case of any absence of a, of any evolutionary influences so when does evolution occur so evolution occurs when there is a violation of the hardy weinberg equilibrium so some situations in which evolution occurs is a non random mating such as inbreeding so in our example we were considering so when we wrote about our punnett squares so whenever we are writing our punnett squares we are saying that all of these values are in are an average of what is happening in the whole of the population so if you have only one individual that is say coming back to our capital p small p cross with capital p and small p so if we have only one individual as male and only one individual as female and there is only one offspring then that offspring can be capital p capital p capital p small p or small p small p but we can never be sure which of these will it be so it is a stochastic phenomenon it is a random phenomenon what of uh, which of these genotypes will the offspring get now uh, when we talk about the ratios 3 is to 1 or 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 or so on we are considering that a number of such matings are happening in a large population of uh, of, uh, of parents that are having these genotypes only then we will be able to make any derivations about the next generation now similarly when we talk about the hardy weinberg equilibrium when we use this formula the expansion that is given by this term this will only be applicable when we are having a large size population if there is a small population or when there is a non random mating so for instance if there is a population in which all tall uh, females prefer only tall males and shorter females prefer only shorter males so we will not be getting an averaged out situation that we were considering in our theoretical example so in that case uh, these these tall individuals will start getting more more preference because not only are their uh, homozygotes tall but also their heterozygotes are tall and they are being selected uh, or uh, they are uh, being uh, chosen in the form of a non random mating so any non random mating or any inbreeding will be a violation of the hardy weinberg uh, equilibrium another example is selection so in our example we were saying that all of these individuals have an equal probability of surviving to the next generation and, and producing their offsprings but this may not always be the case so if there is any selection so in the case of our peppered moths there was a selection against dark moths when we had uh, lighter barks and there was a selection against the light moths when we had darker barks so if there is any such selection then we can have situations in which suppose when uh, we are having only darker colors that are being selected so in the next generation we will have more individuals that are there in the darker colors because they are better able to survive and these individuals are dying off so we will have a directional selection in which the whole population is moving towards darker shade individuals or we could be having a disrupting selection so disrupting selection happens when in situations for instance when uh, tall individuals prefer tall 
mates and shorter individuals prefer shorter mate. So, in that case any mate which comes in between any individual that comes in between is being selected against or this could be in, in situations for example, in the case of uh, birds in which if they have very smaller size beaks they are able to e eat smaller insects, if they have larger size beaks they are able to eat larger insects and in the environment there are no insects that are in the middle size range. So, if it has a shorter beak it will be be having a, a preferential selection, if it has a larger beak it will be having a preferential selection, but not in between. So, such kind of, of selections are called as disrupting se, uh, disruptive selections, because they are disrupting the population and, and putting it into two different extremes. On the other hand we also have some stabilizing selections, in which only the middle parts are selected. So, these are two violations of uh, the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. So, we looked at non random mating and selection. Also another violation is mutation or the, or the generation of new alleles. So, in the case of Hardy Weinberg equilibrium we started with n number of alleles. So, we had a 1, a 2, a 3 and so on up till a n. So, all of these were having their own uh, probabilities or the frequencies. Now, suppose there is a mutation in this population and we have a new allele a n plus 1 with this uh, frequency of p n plus 1. So, in that case when we say that that genotypes and the alleles and their frequencies remain constant across generations that is not possible, because we have the generation of a new allele that has happened. Next is migration, migration is addition of new alleles or changes in the frequencies. So, for instance suppose we had uh, two populations, so one was the population of these dark colored moths. So, most of the individuals were dark in color and then we had a second population of the lighter colored moths. Now, suppose there was a migration and there was a chunk of these individuals that came into this population. So, this migration has brought in some new alleles or it has changed the frequencies of the alleles. So, this is also a violation of the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium, because Hardy Weinberg equilibrium is saying that the genotypes and the allele frequencies will remain constant across all the generations. But here in the first generation, we only had these many individuals, only these many genotypes and this much frequency. But in the second generation, we are having a population that has these alleles as well. So, uh, the genotypes and their frequencies have changed. So, migration also leads to a violation of a Hardy Weinberg equilibrium and this might also lead to some amount of evolution in the population. Next is the small population effect or the random changes due to sampling. So, in case we have a very small population or in case where we have a genetic drift where a very small number of individuals are able to survive to the next generation, then we can have a drastic change in the genotypes and the allele frequencies that are there. So, for instance we can represent this case by this example of, of different colored marbles that are kept in a jar. Now, in the first generation we have uh, 3 marbles of green color, then 3 of blue color. So, th all of these marbles are 3 in number for all different colors. So, the allele frequency is given by, uh, by f green is equal to f blue is equal to f pink is equal to f red is equal to f black is equal to 0 0.2, because there are 5 different colors each of these have 3 individuals and so we are having the same frequencies for all of these. But if you just select a handful of marbles from here and drop it into the second jar, so we are having the allele frequencies that are now given by 1, 2, 3, 3 divided by 5 is uh, 0 0.6 for green and for both of these it is 0 0.2 and 0 0.2 and now there is no pink and there is no red in the population, so this becomes 0. So, when we have situations in which only a small number of individuals are being selected or to get into the next generation just because of a sampling, we say that this is a situation of genetic drift. And in these situations the allele frequencies and also the genotypes that are present in the population will change drastically. Now, an example where this could happen is suppose you had a big a large sized forest. Now, in this large sized forest you had different animals that were having different genotypes. But then there was fire in this forest and all of these areas were burnt out. So, only these individuals have been selected here. Now, were these individuals selected because of any rule 
or because of any formula? So, the answer is no, it just happened by chance that this left portion was burnt out and the right portion survived. So, this is what is happening here as well. So, essentially all these individuals died out and anything that was here survived in the next generation. So, which is why we are getting, so if we take out th these portions, we will get 3 green, 1 blue and 1 black, 3 green, 1 blue and 1 black. So, this is what is happening in this case. All the individuals below my hand died out, all the individuals that were above my hand survived. So, this is an example of genetic drift. So, other examples of genetic drift could include say diseases which wipe out a large portion of the population or say a tsunami in an island. So, most of the individuals get drowned, only a few individuals remain into the next generation or say situations of a founder effect. So, for instance, you had large sized mainland and then there is a small island and then there are only a few individuals that migrate from this mainland into this island. So, now for instance, the individuals that migrated into the island were say taller individuals because they were able to swim and migrate to the to this new island. So, all the individuals that are born in the island will be having a higher uh, a higher frequency of the tall alleles in their population. So, their genotypes and their uh, uh, their allele frequencies in the in the gene pool will be very different from what we see in the mainland. And after a while these changes will be exacerbated because all the individuals in the mainland because they are having their their uh, their gene frequencies that are that will remain constant with generations. So, they will remain in, in an average height, but all the individuals that moved into into the island they started with a taller height and they will continue as a taller height and after a while it may even become that both of these populations will turn out to be very different species because they are now no longer able to breed amongst themselves. So, situations such as these go by the name of genetic drift and these are sampling effects just because there are some individuals that were able to survive or only some individuals that were able to move into the next generation. So, in this lecture we saw that uh, that every population is going to have different individuals and those different individuals are be, are able to mate amongst themselves and they are not mating with any other population that is nearby. So, in these circumstances the genotype and the allele frequencies that are there in the population because they are constantly and randomly mating with each other they remain constant across generations uh, 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 a phenomena that we uh, refer to as the hardy weinberg principle. Now, if there is any deviation in the hardy weinberg principle if these allele frequencies are changing to some, some uh, direction either because of selection or because of non-random mating or because of uh, any new allele that has come up due to a mutation or a migration or maybe uh, some sort of a sampling effect. So, we will get get two populations that are now changing with time. An, ex, uh, an example from the field of wildlife conservation could be tigers from uh, Sundarbans and tigers from Sariska. Both of these populations have remained separate for quite some time. The uh, this uh, our Sundarban population is breeding amongst Sundarban tigers and the Sariska population is breeding amongst the Sariska tigers and they are being put uh, across different selection pressures. So, one population is in a very hot and dry climate, the second population is in a very humid, uh, humid climate and has to swim a lot. So, because of these different selection pressures that are acting on both of these populations, we develop different traits and different, uh, different uh, allele frequencies in both of these different populations. Now, when we talk about conservation of uh, any species, all of these variations need to be conserved. Conservation of these variations important because we do not know in future which of these condition, uh, which of these differences will be important for us. So, for instance, if uh, to take an extreme example, suppose the whole of our country became flooded. So, in that case, Sundarban tigers will be able to survive, but all other tigers will be slowly wiped off. Or for instance, because of climate change, all of this area became extremely hot and dry. So, Sariska tigers will be in a better better position to survive, but the other populations of tigers will be slowly exterminated. So, when we talk about conservation of a species, it is important to maintain all of these, con uh, these different variations because we do not know what the future will bring for us. So, maintaining of all of these different 
variations is important and it is also important that we do not mix all of these different populations together otherwise we will come up with a population that is neither suited for uh, for Sundarban like areas not suited for Sariska like areas. So, we discussed all these different topics in this lecture. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.